Thank you. Thank you, Clay. Also, special thanks to David Heyman, who's been such a great tour guide and sort of ambassador for the school and for the city of Austin. We had a great tour and saw a lot of um, special spaces in the city. And um, I look forward to um, coming back often and soon and often. Um, so thanks for having me. It's really an honor to be here. It's great to be here um, with Michelle. We were just chatting that we were visiting a couple years ago when she was in the throes of, of um, deciding to come here. So it's, it's really great to see you here and hear such good things about your tenure already. Um, today I've put together a selection of projects and I think they represent a pretty diverse range of, of scale and typologies in our practice. And as a way to frame the, I think, a number of the sort of obsessions that we um, think about in our practice, I wanted to introduce a number of, of themes that somehow course through the work um, despite scale, program, or, or typology. The first has to do with an idea about ecology, and I think I should say that, you know, sort of starting our practice in Southern California, Rainer Banham has been really instrumental in our thinking, and of course his book about the ecologies of Los Angeles um, became really a sort of benchmark and a set of um, types of spaces in the city that we aspire to be able to work in. So, um, but for us, the idea of ecology really means it's a way of thinking in a kind of expanded and more, more um, perhaps a deeper way about site and context. It has to do with history, it has to do with the environment and atmosphere, and it allows us to, um, I think, be able to situate the kind of research that we're doing in our projects of different scales within a larger set of ideas. And so that started out in Southern California and has begun to expand um, to other parts of the United States and abroad. Uh, secondly is an interest in typology. I think um, the work, in our work, we're always searching for a kind of um, getting towards a set of disciplinary questions. So kind of distilling down um, a set of problems into something that really approaches a kind of core question in architecture. And I don't think we approach typology as a kind of given, but what we, we think a lot about it is a kind of approximating of type. So through research on structure, um, planning, um, formal studies, we began to approximate certain kinds of typologies in the work. There's a kind of instability in that, which is something that is interesting to us. Um, the, third, the third point I wanted to raise is um, our interest in history. Um, for us, you know, these kinds of collages and drawings, I think, reflect um, our interest in history and the way in which we're, we think of history both as something to measure against, and a lot of times through these kinds of drawings and, and model making, we're we're thinking about buildings um, and situations, particular moments in time that we want to measure ourselves against. The last kind of category is, is our engagement with art. And I think for us, um, artists and, and working in the kind of cultural realm has been part of our practice since the beginning. And I think it's not because we see ourselves as artists or are interested in sort of an artistic practice as architects. but. I think that, that um, the work with artists, or the way that we, we collaborate with them on our projects or on projects for them helps us, um, I think, bring a sort of um, different and deeper set of questions about our work. And I think I will talk a little bit in a bit about um, the role of collaboration in our, in our practice, which I think is a kind of expanded um, around um, the role that artists play in the work. So for today, I've divided the lecture into roughly three parts that approximates different scales in our work, from kind of smaller, singular objects um, to buildings that begin to either formally or structurally begin to sort of multiply and approximate something larger. And then I'm going to end with three um, museum projects. And so starting with um, some of our earlier house projects, this is the Hill House in the uh, foothills of Southern California, so the first um, category of, of Rainer Banham's book on the ecologies of Southern California. Um, I think like most young architects in, in Southern California, maybe everywhere, we tend to get the sort of hardest and seemingly impossible building sites. So this was nearly a 50% slope. It was part of a larger property, so it was tiny and steep and unstable structurally. And so our approach was first, we, of course, our client wanted us to build the biggest possible house. So we, um, this was in the days of Form Z, if any of you guys probably no one knows what that is, but um, it was pre-Rhino, and we began to develop the model that would allow us to both work with the nuances of the typo typography to form the biggest envelope and then calibrate that with 
structure, water runoff, and resulting in um, the form that you see on the lower, I guess that's your left. Uh, I think for us, um, something that also an, an, an interest we have in the, in the kind of intersection of the way that structure, form, and, and aperture work together. So these kinds of diagrams were both, um, I think, capture the different spatial sensibilities of this project and some of the other ones you'll see where there's this sort of very volumetric sense of the panoramic view contrasting with the sort of punctured deep windows that um, in their recess create privacy and create a very different uh, visual relationship to the landscape um, around the building. So um, the models, which is, a, which is a medium that we work in a lot, um, reveal this sort of maximization and, and minimization of conditions in many of our projects. So a very steep slope, so minimizing the footprint of the building, maximizing the volume, and then the way that the, the apertures work is very much in response to um, all of the environmental conditions from the noisy road where there's no window to the kind of great view spaces. So um, the building is um, clad in a material called grail coat. And it was, since it was conceived in such a three-dimensional way, um, it was important to us that it had, it was the material treatment of the envelope was treated in the same way conceptually. And so walls, um, roofs, and these sloping um, kind of foundation planes are all clad in a, this material called gray grail coat, which is a cementitious, very flexible membrane. Um, one of the hardest parts of designing this building was figuring out how to engage the road and actually have a driveway that works. So this is the view from the street. You enter into the middle of the house and there's a floor above and below. Uh, inside the house, perhaps in contrast to the kind of sense of mass of the exterior, it's, it's very volumetric. And through different studies, we, we landed on this kind of formal and structural resolution for the building, but which meant there were no outdoor spaces within the mass of the house. And so the approach was to make this feel almost like an indoor-outdoor space through the way that we treated the windows, the flooring. So it, it really feels almost like a gazebo-type space. The ceiling is not vaulted, but the way in which the corner curves just slightly at the intersection. Um, let's see if I can get this pointer to work. Um, no, I guess that was the wrong, um, wrong button. But anyway, um, that, that intersection right where the column is, um, is curved. So it, it gives this kind of vaulted sense um, to the interior space. The building, um, it's very close to the Eames house, and so um, we were quite self-conscious about um, the, the kind of scale of the structure in the building, um, having to address contemporary codes. So we don't reveal any structure in the building except for the core, which is really runs down the center of the house um, that the stair is hung from. So essentially that runs across the house north-south, and then everything is cantilevered off of that, and then all of that structure is embedded within the walls of the building, except for this one beam that you see behind the glass. During the process of designing the building, um, we submitted the house for a PA award. And um, when we won, this was a collage that we'd made that probably, or hopefully most of you guys are familiar with, a, a famous picture by the photographer Julia Schulman of um, one of the case study houses. And we, took that famous image and began to cut it up and reconfigure it to suggest um, what we thought was the sort of essence of this house, which was this kind of hovering interior space, the distant horizon um, of Los Angeles, eroding away um, the foreground of the pool and all of those other elements. And when we won um, the competition, our friends, our lawyer friends said, you better talk to Julius because he might see this and sue you. And so, of course, we didn't want that. So we took him to lunch. And he said, you, you can use my image as long as you let me photograph the house. Um, so when it was finished, um, that's what happened. It was really the beginning of our collaborations with artists and photographers. And Julius created this kind of eerie um, portfolio of images like this, which were very cinematic, a very kind of particular um, approach to using light. And um, uh, Julius was very fastidious, so he hated all of our furniture and brought in his own furniture, his own art, and um, it was quite an intense four days, but we, we survived it. Um, he was very particular, for example, in the way that the, um, the Yakuza chair was positioned so that the curve of the chair received the stair, so sort of very beautiful and kind of cinematic details that were, we learned a lot from him in the, in the collaboration. 
Um, so the next kind of typology um, going back to, um, to Banham is the kind of plains of Id. Um, fortunately, this is not Los Angeles, but the plains of Argentina. And this was a project that we were um, commissioned to do in, as a, on a, a kind of old horse farm was being transformed into a residential neighborhood. And it was interesting to us because it was a kind of suburban lot, not unlike many that we have in Southern California. The scale was a bit bigger, but we were one of the first houses to be built there, and we knew we were going to anticipate a pretty dense development over time. And so the kind of cinematic flow through the house helped us choreograph where windows would be and views. And so that, that was really a driver both um, for the form of the house on the interior and also um, I think a response to the idea of the sort of more typical zoning for single family houses which have side yards and front yards and rear yards that tend to have very kind of restrictive um, dimensions and kind of parameters. And so the idea for the house was that there really was no front. It, through its form, it continued to draw you around in a kind of centripetal way around the form and that there was the kind of hierarchies that we're used to were eroded by that, by that figure in the structure. It's a cast in place concrete building, um, which is very typical and sort of vernacular type building type in Argentina. This is in Rosario. And it was, I mean, very primitive in a way. And so the idea for us in, we had, there were restrictions about the form um, and the building, the footprint size. But the, um, as we began to evolve the form of the house, we, we worked within a very primitive language that we knew um, uh, these builders who were typically used to building churches and which include domes and spheres, kind of very um, primitive uh, geometric figures that, that so this, the cuts that are um, kind of inserted into this very basic figure are either planes or portions of a sphere. So the house, as you move around it, sometimes feels quite embedded into the ground or other times sort of lofting up to um, cantilever over the ground. And um, that, that kind of dynamism is somehow reflected in the way that the um, light works within the house. So each one of the kind of planar cuts is partnered with a, with a window. Um, I'm going to try this one more time. That's the bottom one. Thank you, Eric. So <laughs> let's see. So this is um, a window, and then that's one of the kind of sloping planes above. You can also see it here. So somehow the pairing of the, the window aperture is such that light comes in that window and reflects off those planes. So it has a kind of um, a landscape quality to it on the interior as well. And then in other cases, because of the orientation of the window with the sun, the windows are poked into the building so that they benefit from the roof as an, as an overhang. And then these kind of poche spaces are eventually built out with storage elements. So just a few views um, from now up above in that loft space, looking back down into the living room. Oftentimes in, in this house, um, areas where you expect the most kind of dense structure, um, you, we, we insert either apertures like skylights or our artificial lights. So this is not a skylight, but just a, a carving out of the structure and um, with an artificial light. So the way that that light works with the curve of that cut on the exterior is something that um, we, were, we were striving for. And then um, perhaps then on the, ex on the second floor, this is a skylight. So this is a moment of a lot of sort of structural intensity, but we are able to hide the beams and then put a skylight on the roof. So it sort of creates this quality of sort of loftedness in, an, in a place in the building where you'd expect heaviness and, and darkness. So you spiral through the building and then end up on the roof, which is sort of the final aperture to the sky with this overscaled stair. And here's the resulting building. Mark always loves that um, there was a lot of blogging comments when this building was done. And um, the compliment, he thought it was the greatest compliment for the building, that it was somehow a hybrid between Mario Bota and a septic tank. So um, <laughs> you can judge for yourself. But in any case, it does, it is, the feeling of the house changes quite a lot at night when the windows start to kind of push the volume out into the landscape. Um, then the vault house. This is um, um, the Surferbia in, in Banham's um, lexicon. This is a house um, in the town of Oxnard, so it's north of Los Angeles but below Santa Barbara. And I think we were really excited to work on this house because we felt like the sort of typology of the beach house in Southern California was kind of understudied and it's quite challenging and even more so because of rising sea levels and things like that. So, 
For our project, it's a parcel of about 140 feet in length and 30 feet wide, so pretty extreme. And what we noted um, in many of the houses that we've, we've been in on the beach, that it's generally that front kind of 30 feet that have views of the ocean that are quite spectacular, and the rest of the building could really be anywhere. So the first move that we made just in terms of planning was to introduce a courtyard into the middle of the building. Um, we're also fortunate that this, built, this is not built yet. This is an open lot. So that was a sort of interesting benefit. And finally, that we somehow the zoning changed. So we're about 15 feet further out than our neighbor, which you'll sort of see how we captured that in the, in the plan. So I think for us, the, the program was for a family. The parents, their, their daughters were not, no longer living with them. And they were interested in um, a house that felt um, full with um, just two people and very comfortable when their entire family was there or a large party. And so the idea for us was to find one kind of singular room, integer of a room, which is this vaulted space, and then align all of those rooms within the maximum buildable envelope of the, of the building, of the, of the volume of the house. So this is a sort of heuristic model of that, and all of the rooms are oriented in one direction. And what that results in is almost like a kind of kaleidoscopic effect where when you're even in the furthest most room from the view of the water, you see the light, you have the view, and air passes through the entire house. So it really does feel almost like a kaleidoscope in that way. Um, these are a series of models of uh, the development of the building. And our approach was as we began to kind of massage the, the program and kind of function of, of the building, we, we were disciplined about never really massaging or smoothing out where these vaults intersected. So that what resulted in, I um, can't see this that well, sorry. Um, but sometimes there's a kind of really nice kind of occluded quality that happens here when you're in the master bedroom looking through the double height space of the living room out to the beach. And then perhaps other moments where it's a little bit more disjointed like, like here where there's more of a kind of clashing of vaults that almost results in a more gothic type of vaulting. But we just decided we were going to let that be and that was the system of the house. So there's almost no circu designated circulation. There's one stair. But other than that, it's always just moving between, between these rooms, whether they're courtyards or interior spaces. The view from the beach, uh, another kind of particular quality of this building is that it's in a tsunami zone. So it's raised about, I mean, that the, the level changes, but let's say average of about 10 feet off the ground. And we brought that structure below grade two. So it, it becomes a much more kind of three-dimensional structural landscape um, above and below the, the occupiable slab. And then on the, on the, ocean, the street side, um, that same language is present, but it, it um, we introduced some asymmetries in scale into um, those figures. And as well, I think perhaps in contrast to the more kind of vernacular or sort of pseudo vernacular Spanish type of um, kind of facade or planning, um, we think of the vault as a kind of extruded volume. So it's not just an aperture, but it's actually an extruded space. So you can see into the bedrooms of the, of the girls on the, on the east side of the building. And even um, we looked at the way the vault could carve out space in the kind of thin setbacks of these houses so that we made a more generous entry. So primarily, you enter along the side of the house as a guest and into the open courtyard. So you can see now the kind of the street and the ocean side and the short elevations and then the long elevations that primarily um, we're anticipating will have neighbors at some point. We do have a one neighbor on the north side. Um, but those windows are largely for light, but not necessarily for view. So this is the house that was finished in 2013. The, the level, every time we're there, the level of the sand is different. So it's a pretty dynamic landscape, um, depending on the time of the year, the wind levels. So we're going to kind of do a quick sequence. This is um, the middle of the house with the stairs into the, um, the open air courtyard, which is how you'd enter as a guest. And so here we're looking um, east back towards um, the street and the aperture to the sky. And then this is looking the other way back towards the ocean. And the window on the second floor is to the master bedroom. So instead of taking over all of that front, front view real estate within the house, it's suspended between the court. The master is suspended between the courtyard to the east and the double height space um, to the west. That's not the client, but um, <laughs> he likes to think of himself that way. <laughs> um, so this is now looking back into the courtyard and up to the master, um, master bedroom. 
So there was a lot of study when we began to think about these clerestory windows um, and the inverted, um, the inverted figure of that window allowed us to kind of alleviate some sort of an odd groin vault at that intersection, but the, the, the kind of edge of that aperture created one more sort of vault within that space that created a sort of an intimacy and scale in the living room relative to the master bedroom. So that's one of those um, spaces I pointed out. And then that, that, that additional 15 feet that I mentioned becomes another sort of aperture that is quite a beautiful, um, beautiful vista back out to the ocean where you really don't see your neighbor and you have that sort of nice sight line. View from upstairs, looking back down, where you see those sort of occluded vaults there. Now we're on the other side of the courtyard looking back out. I think you get a sense of how that view of the beach and the way the light flows through um, the length of the house is, um, is present. And I think right around the time we were finishing um, this house, we began to work on this monograph that Clay so, um, so well, so, so proficiently um, um, declared the title, which I won't say again. It's a bit of a tongue twister. But anyway, um, the idea for that book was not to think about it as a monograph. We'd started to being asked to do monographs, and we felt like it was too early in our career to take that on. We didn't want a book that would somehow encapsulate the first 10 years of our practice, but one more that would help us project forward. And so we did something that was sort of crazy. We wouldn't do it again, but we invited um, five artists that were close collaborators of ours or friends to create portraits of um, our five houses. And then the other kind of layer to that is um, a series of conversations. So I'm just gonna go through a few of those portraits. This is Jack Pearson. The, uh, he works a lot in photography and other media, but this is his images of the vault house. And we love that he, in these fragments, began to capture another um, sort of almost everyday quality of the building without revealing its whole form. We began to see these fragments in just this kind of simple ways that light began to define um, different contours of the building. Or James Welling, also an artist that works a lot in photography. Um, and we've done a lot of exhibition design for created um, these images of the porch house, which is a cast in place concrete building, sort of a heavy building, but these very strong apertures in the ceilings and walls. So these are um, views of those, of those skylights. Uh, Luisa Lambri, the Italian um, Milan-based photographer. Um, this is, these are images of um, the Hill House. And Luisa almost never works looking, she always, architecture is often the subject of her work, but that she never looks at buildings from the exterior. And she was so captivated by the kind of subtlety of the way light worked on the form of the, of the Hill House that she looked at a couple important corners of the building. And so just, this is obviously the same view, but different times of day, capturing um, the way light reflected and kind of captured the texture and, and folding of that plane. Um, or alternatively, another corner. And I guess I should say here that when we were designing the Hill House, we were, of course, completely stumped by what color it should be. And so we, Jack Pearson, whose work you just saw, um, we brought him to the site and spent the whole day looking at the landscape with him. And from those conversations, looked really closely at the eucalyptus trees around the house, which are kind of define that canyon in Los Angeles. And so this is a kind of lavender color that we found in, those eucalypt in the bark of the eucalyptus tree. And what was special about it was that it changes depending on how light plays on it. So, I mean, if you can imagine, we were painting, we were looking at blue and orange and all these crazy colors, but ended up with this sort of subtle lavender that sometimes looks gray or white or purple. So that was, um, we were saved by Jack Pearson um, from having a blue house. Um, so this is... Veronica Kellendorfer, she did a portrait of the Hill House in relationship to uh, another landscape in, on the island of Catalina that she had visited that reminded her very much of this sort of almost tropical but desert-like landscape. And Marianne Mueller, uh, an artist from Zurich, she created um, the extended cover for the book and she, we've known her for a very long time and so she created a portrait really of us and our city through this diptych structure. So these pages um, form the beginning and the end of the book that include our work and inspiring spaces in the city. Um, and then Wally Beshti is an artist based in Los Angeles and he was sort of obsessed with the, um, the kind of faceology of our work. Um, if you, so he developed, um, we, we got some software for him and he created this kind of funny narrative um, and conversation among our projects um, as a, a special insert in the book. 
And other projects um, that have come from these, from this sort of portraiture, um, this is, was not in the book, but it was a commission by Wallpaper Magazine um, for, the, this is the uh, Torbjorn Rodland, um, created this sort of crazy crime scene that happened at the Vault House. Um, and we, we really appreciate that kind of um, narrative that was inspired by the house. This is another project by Livia Corona. It was for a client called Sale, and this is called House for Sale. So she commissioned these senior citizen actors to um, come, um, sort of a story about these looky-loos that occupy the house, because it wasn't, um, they didn't live in the house immediately after it was finished. So she was playing on the geometry. This is on the site of the 2468 house by Morphosis, so these colors and the geometry were inspired by that. Um, and she was really interested in gerontology, uh, gerontology at that time, so we, we love that kind of collaboration. This elegant lady on the stairs. And then this is the book, a um, couple of pages of the book, how the conversations work. This was, we developed this book. It was designed and edited by Rachel Geiser, who's a professor at Rice and a longtime collaborator of ours. So drawings were also part of it. And it's just a quick movie. I don't know if it's in your library, but if it's not, I'll send you guys a copy. <laughs> So some of our earliest projects started in Texas. Our very first projects were in Marfa, Texas, and they were very modest um, renovations for a foundation that's now based in Santa Fe called Lannan Foundation. They bought some of these historic bungalows and we transformed them into writers and resident studios. And this work was really important for us because it, um, this was a single family house we built um, out of adobe construction with local, um, local contractors. It was such a powerful artist community for us. We'd studied with some of these artists when we were in graduate school, but to really do these sort of quite modest, but, but you know, somehow germane to the beginning of our career projects and spend so much time in Marfa. Judd was a really important artist and thinker for us as students. Was, I think, really um, important not only to our intellectual development, but also for many of the friends who eventually became clients. I think that sort of creative community was, was really important. After Marfa, we you know, worked on small-scale houses, some of which you saw, and began to work on galleries, a lot of times re kind of adaptively reusing um, industrial buildings in Los Angeles, um, and then began to work with like an artist, artist press. Um, this is, a, this is the, the press that um, Sam Francis started in Los Angeles called Lapis, or in kind of important bookstores and kind of cultural centers in Los Angeles. And then we also have had a long-standing um, kind of involvement with museums in Los Angeles, um, creating exhibitions. So this is not with a living artist, but this was um, the work of Laszlo Moholy Naj that was on view um, in Chicago and Los Angeles, and I think also at the Guggenheim. So this was the show in, in LA, um, and this was a chance for us to really dive deeply into that work and begin to express some of the principles of um, Laszlo's research and space through exhibition design. So we love these kind of quick opportunities to begin to think about the relationship of art and space. We work a lot with the Hammer Museum in Los Angeles. This is a show of Robert Heineken. And then um, James Welling. So we've done a number of exhibitions with Jan Jim. Um, and I think he's such a great partner for us because he, we understand his work well. And we began to think about um, designing these exhibitions as, at, from a very early stage in his process. We've also done some of his gallery shows. And um, one of the first exhibition designs we did was with Takeshi Murakami um, that was originally started at MoCA in Los Angeles. And it was an interesting show because it was a moment he was really well known, but, but maybe not as well known as he is today. And this, um, the room that we designed was called the Kakakiki Merchandise Room. And it was the sort of small ephemera pieces that were highly commercial. But he, was, interested, he beca was becoming really interested in this kind of zen qualities of space. And so we, we loved the idea that we were taking the most kind of ephemeral and commercial qualities or objects in his, in his practice and making this kind of surreal, quiet space. And we developed this modular system that then was um, implemented in all the spaces that the show traveled. Uh, we also like to work with artists on buildings. And this was a competition that we developed with um, Sam Durant, the artist that is Large, long, for a long time based in LA and now in Berlin. This was a competition um, that we were finalists for for the Natural History Museum in Basel, and so we worked with Sam 
um, to develop a kind of facade idea that was his research into the holdings of the museum that were then going to be implemented as a kind of terracotta paneling system that um, would, would potentially evolve over time to reflect the kind of historical evolution of the building. Or with Walid, we've designed objects like this sculptural modular base and exhibitions. Um, and then finally, this project, which is for a foundation we've done a lot of work for. It was a winery in, um, in Multipucciano in Italy that was for wine production, but also exhibitions and installations with artists. And this is a project we worked with Daniel Buren. So he's developing a site-specific um, sculpture for the courtyard. And these drawings um, were sort of the reason that we're still very nostalgic about our fax machine, because that was the only way Daniel would, would be able to communicate with us. He doesn't email, and so we'd get these sort of cryptic faxes and narratives, and then we'd colorize them and build models based on those notes. So um, we still have a fax machine because of Daniel Buren. Um, I think the next series of projects is um, sort of beginning to look at this, the buildings multiplying, or sort of this this, the kind of serial structures. And I think this also marks a moment in our career kind of around 2008, 2009, where we began to get invited to kind of collective projects, projects where architects were instigating um, larger scale projects where they were inviting architects. And this was for a project in Chile. Uh, around 2010, um, there was a pretty devastating earthquake in the Bio Bio region, and so part of that reconstruction was um, involved inviting a number of architects to um, create kind of cultural buildings or buildings that could be adaptive to immediate needs, but then eventually as the community stabilized could be used for cultural programming, which is kind of a radical thing because housing and the sort of most immediate um, kind of everyday functions are typically what first dollars are invested in. So our site was in Penko, which is... Um, Within that region, we were in a kind of beautiful pine forest that overlooked the Bay of Panko. So this is the view from our site. And I, for us, we thought about, given the sort of devastation of the earthquake, that it was both a kind of commemorative project to recognize the devastation, but also a building that would support kind of creative practice into the future. And so we, um, we took the program, which was about 4,000 square feet and of interior space, and we doubled that to create an exterior courtyard. So this is what you see here, and then eventually how it got inscribed in the walls of the building. And that form came from um, really looking at the shape of that bay and sort of mirroring that back into the building, that sort of gentle ellipse. So the first space that you enter, when you enter the building is an open air courtyard. It's open to the sky, and then when you enter into the building, um, you have that horizontal view um, to, the land, to, the, to the bay. It's a very sort of primitive building. These two elliptical forms are inscribed in a wall and this kind of space between them. They, they touch just at one point, which is where you enter, and this poche space is where all the services are. About two years ago, the building isn't built yet, but it's still slowly moving its way through. Um, it was inherited by a dance organization, so it eventually now has a two stories. One, the, the, the open dance studio now has a lower level so that we expanded the capacity of the building. So when you enter right on the, at the corner of the um, courtyard, you have kind of one moment where you have this diagonal view all the way through. But other than that, it feels almost bunker-like. It doesn't reveal itself um, at all, really, and when you um, approach it within the forest. And um, the texture of the walls um, is a sort of scalloped concrete form, so that there's really um, almost no kind of specific material expression except for that, that figuration in plan of the curve of the courtyard. And then um, those scallops came from, um, we, we had to remove a couple of trees to find um, sort of the minimum, the footprint we found that minimized the number of trees we had to remove. But then as a way to commemorate that, we made, we, we made molds of those trees and they formed that kind of scallop shape. So somehow imprinting that landscape back into the building. On the interior, um, we were interested in the kind of sweep of the bay, trying to fold that back into the, into the vo interior volume. So the, the treatment of the walls, it's a, again a concrete building, um, but it's um, sort of hand polished so that it has a very dull reflection. So you're looking at a view out and then that's, that view subtly reflected on that wall that sweeps all around you. So you really feel embraced by that view of the bay. Not long after that, we were invited to um, a biennial in Shanghai. And again, a group project, and not all the projects were built for the opening of the biennial. This was finished in 2013. 
but our project was one of the ones that was built. And it was a kind of crazy situation because there was no program and you know all those things you can imagine in biennials that are built fast and want to have longevity, but no one knows what they're really supposed to do. And so we, um, this project we've called the Pavilion of Six Views. And the idea is that it has six, six of the pavilions are looking outward towards the city, and then three are oriented inwards to create kind of one contiguous space. And programmatically, we had the idea that it could be used as one building or perhaps six different small pop-ups. So those views looking out are capturing the city, which is now a sort of major, undergoing major development. David Chipperfield is building a museum across the street and there's housing everywhere. So it really was um, a an, an kind of agent for change along the Bund in Shanghai. And then the central courtyard orients those inward looking volumes. So some, the building feels at some moments quite small in footprint and other times kind of sprawls out across the triangular um, footprint of the site. And I think the overall the form for us was, was intended to approximate some of the industrial silos and this sort of larger, larger scale anonymous architecture of this industrial region as it transformed. Um, we thought a lot about um, how natural light could, could, could animate the space. Um, so these sort of um, kind of open picture window type um, configurations and then at the apex of each curve was a skylight, so there was always sort of the, the light changed quite dramatically throughout the day. The building was finished, and then not long after, it was adapted by the Shanghai Center for Photography, which wasn't really the obvious um, tenant for this building, given the demands for low light levels and straight walls. But in any case, they really loved the building, so these are some images of some of their shows. Um, and I guess in the Chinese tradition, you don't ever want to walk into a corner, so there's this sort of strange ad hoc garden in the building. The plants are like the um, decoys. This building was built really, really fast. Mark went to the opening, and the night before, or two days before it was opening, he was just thought, there's no way this is going to be built or finished by the opening. And he went you know, the day of the opening, and it was finished. So it's not perhaps the, the most high quality construction, but it was prefab Chinese style. Um, so anyway, it was an interesting experience. Um, Working, working in China. It's probably the last time we've built there. But um, now we're going to kind of sequence into um, some of the cultural projects. And uh, I think for us, um, this, is a, this is an artist, uh, kind of art studio or a gallery on a private um, residence in Los Angeles. And it was on the site of a historic Paul Williams um, estate. And so there was you know, a very significant architectural home on the property that you can just catch a glimpse of up here. So the kind of megaron-shaped roof was somehow responding to that. And we wanted a really elemental structure because it, you know, it's, I mean, it's not a small building, but it wanted to have a certain amount of modesty in terms of kind of simple materials. So it's two galleries and then the kind of ancillary spaces for support and infrastructure, kitchens and things like that. So you enter on the west side and this kind of cut into the building is really a sort of light animator. So at different times of day, this is reflects light and shadow. It's really like a movie screen. Um, and then you enter into the first gallery, which is um, smaller in proportion in terms of section. Um, it's adjacent to a low light gallery and a video gallery. So the, and then the system for lighting is, is a very basic um, pitch roof. And then the skylights are hidden on either side. So working um, in a very fundamental way with the intersection of architecture and, and daylight is something that um, I think you'll see in, in our museum projects that are a little bit later in the lecture. This is the second gallery, the large painting gallery, which is ex exactly the same configuration of the small gallery, but it's like just different proportion um, for larger scale works. And so in keeping that sort of primitiveness of the double roof, um, we also capture like the entry that carves out. Here the roof extends out and creates a kind of simple porch. And then finally, the building is largely viewed from above from um, the main residence. So this zinc cladding was used on the walls and the roof. So it has a kind of singularity in terms of its material treatment as well as um, the simplicity of the form. This is a project in Chicago um, that was in collaboration with the artist Theaster Gates and um, the University of Chicago. It's just on the west side of um, Washington Park. And then the university is here um, on the east side of the park. And Theaster has been working on this property for a number of years. He's developed a gallery, a bookstore, a restaurant on the west side of the property. 
And so the Green Line Arts Center is here. It's right next to the Green Line Rail Line. And it's, it has a historic facade that we intend to preserve. Um, but it was in really terrible shape. So here's the elevation of that. So the idea was to insert a new building into this kind of historic shell and work with a very basic structural system so that we could create a bay um, logic that would help us with planning and also make the building quite flexible. So here are some views from it um, from the street. So it maintains that street scale with the historic facade and then inserts a kind of larger scale um, of volumes for the performing spaces. This typology of roofs comes both from the sort of factories that are some of which are still standing in the south side of Chicago, but also the sort of uh, residential landscape um, of single family houses, which are in a way largely disappearing, but still trying to con conflate those two typologies into an iconic, but somehow not um, t totally recognizable as an institutional um, building. So the way those bays work is that they accommodate um, a theater, um, a kind of rehearsal space, a black box theater. So this is for movies, this is for dance and performance, and then another um, kind of flex space. And it's largely um, will be run by, um, by locals in the community and then a, a home for independent dance and film organizations but it equally has the uh, mission to really become a, a host for events in the community. So it, the modular rooms can open up and it can become one continuous 8,000 square foot space. The Astros experience working in, um, around Green Line was such that you know, instead of thinking about it as a kind of defensive facade to the neighborhood, we made the building as transparent as we could so that we could really bring the street life into the building and make people feel welcome, which has been really successful in his other projects. So the visibility through the building is, is such that you kind of always can have a sense of what's happening in the building. And these are the rehearsal spaces that can open up to the larger, more formal performance rooms. And then this one um, on the south side of the building opens up to the neighborhood. The front and the back are really reciprocal so that you don't really have a sense where the hierarchy of front and back is. And we had the plan, um, this building will be a very long time in the making, but these are bricks that the Astor's been able to harvest from different kind of defunct brick factories around the country. So our work and his work will be really embedded in, in the building and conceiving of the building. And I think for these kinds of projects, cultural projects that um, are embedded in neighborhoods where they're really challenged because of economics or violence. The mission for these projects is also very much about spreading out into the, into the context. So this building is really thought of as a host structure. So a lot of the programming will spill out into the city and um, engage in kind of larger scale production. So this, this very basic structural system could easily expand out into the entire arts block. And the idea is one of the programs in this facility will be um, set design. So young people in the, in the community have been trained already in the, in the gallery. There's also a workshop in the workshop building. And so we can use these as sort of open air, sheltered, but unconditioned spaces um, during certain seasons of the year. And then um, the UCLA project, in a way, slightly similar in terms of arts education, but this is at the Graduate School of Art for UCLA. It's in, the Culver, uh, it's in Culver City in the Hayden Track area. So a historically kind of active industrial neighborhood that's now been sort of gentrified by a lot of technology companies. So this is the existing site, um, a kind of ad hoc group of buildings, many of which were not really functional anymore. So the kind of planning principle was to, res was to preserve the historic warehouse, create one continuous floor by pouring a new slab, inscribing the entire site, which is about 55,000 square feet, and then creating a new roof over that entire structure. So the, the, the campus as a whole is about 55,000 square feet. And the idea was to restore the historic warehouse and then add this new um, kind of layer of labs, classrooms, and tech spaces that they didn't have before. So we're expanding that historic kind of bow truss roof. And then underneath that, they, these are the double height labs. Um, and they're connected by covered but unconditioned yards with areas for production. And then the third one of those is up here in the corner, which is the entry to the building. A couple of views um, of, of the building. 
So this is, a, this is an image of that corner yard, and it's um, a, a place for, for making. It's also a place for passing through work that travels from a, one of the production yards, perhaps into the studios or into the gallery. So this kind of highly efficient planning exercise allowed us to create much more programmatic area and much more efficiency in terms of circulation. So this is the view towards the north, and this is the view to the east. So this is kind of one, con it, it largely functioned as one continuous 7,000 square foot of feet of production just simply through the, the kind of planning and the enfilade connections. And then the third space is um, a garden. Um, one of our lead donors was very interested in, believed in the importance of the garden as a space for convening, um, for eating, uh, as a kind of social space for the students. So we incorporated the garden. This is a rendered view of, um, of that garden, which is, which is, as I said, a kind of meeting space, an eating space, could be a classroom space or just a, a crit space. And then in the heart of um, the warehouse building is what they call Center Bay. So this is, you can see, um, just comparing the way the, the glue lamb kind of contemporary structure with is a columnless space is, is, is building on the language of the kind of stick um, bow truss um, structure of the old, um, the old warehouse. And then that warehouse is configured as where all the individual artist studios. So there's 42 studios, um, and this we think of it as a kind of neighborhood of, of, of for for the artists, um, so everybody has their own studio, and it's this kind of collective space um, that it, um, is defined by the, the kind of wooden roof structure of the, the warehouse. Then this is um, one of the yards on the exterior of the building, that corner yard, the garden is also present in these spaces. So the building is, um, we're, it's kind of an exciting moment for the project. All of the exterior panels are tilt-up concrete, so right now across the site, are I think it's 31 panels that are all ready to be poured. I think they're getting poured tomorrow. So we, it was a very, very tight budget. And so the idea that as a way to bring detail to the building was to create these pillowed um, panels, which um, really have no detail except for the way when light hits them, that it creates a kind of cinematic quality to the way light falls on these curve, um, curve planes of the, of the concrete. So this is a view um, from the south of the building into those yards. And then what happens at night is those spaces are illuminated and the polycarbonate roof also illuminates. So it, it's the only institutional building in this neighborhood. It was very important that it had a kind of stealthy quality about it, but that somehow through its scale and through the way light worked in the building, it, it somehow signaled um, something larger than just um, a kind of commercial, private commercial building. Um, this is the last three projects. This is um, the Museum of Contemporary Art in Los Angeles. And we, um, the museum is kind of undergoing a lot of change, but last year we were commissioned to do a master plan to sort of re-envision the public spaces of the museum. And for those of you that have been to LA recently, the Broad was finished a couple years ago, which has really activated the street in a very different way. And I think the MOCA realized they needed to rethink the kind of language of, of open space in the museum. It's on Bunker Hill. There was a lot of restrictions of what the rooftops of these buildings could look like because of the neighboring towers that were part of the development. So this is Isosaki from um, the mid 80s. Um, and for us, we, we really thought there were some special qualities about the building. Um, it somehow has um, endured historically in the city quite well. And so we did a kind of in-depth survey of all of the spaces, the museum, and the way in which the city has evolved perhaps differently than Isosaki originally had planned um, in designing the building. So these are some of his early sketches for the project, very de kind of de Chirico-esque of this kind of surreal, abstract, um, primitive forms in this um, haze of Los Angeles. And this is actually how um, the project has evolved historically. And what's happened is that there's very little public life um, behind the museum. It's, there's some hotels and there's now an art school, but it, it never really had the kind of activation that was originally planned. And as a result, the museum has attempted with bigger and bigger signage and graphics to sort of call out the presence of the, of the museum. But they realized that it was you know, time to sort of rethink, as the city grew up around the museum, what, what should the identity of the public spaces of MOCA be? So this is a series of before and afters. So this is the existing condition with this kind of spectacular Nancy Rubin sculpture in the plaza. But there was really no definition to this space. So what we propose as a way to almost deepen the connection to the city was um, the idea of introducing, um, where is my clicker? Uh, a new, um, a, a wall that would divide um, the plaza from the space beyond it. So 
while maybe counterintuitive, by separating the spaces, it created a more distinguished space for the museum. So this becomes um, a sculptured courtyard, and we bring some of the public programs like the cafe and bookstore up to that floor. And then expand the, or continue the language of the sandstone. We felt like that was appropriate, and, and in a way, um, you know, sometimes those, those kind of historical traces are actually what would bring continuity um, to the project, and as, instead of introducing a new material language to the building. So this is the existing entry. One of the confusing things about this building is that you enter below. There was restrictions about, like, like I mentioned, about viewing from above. So it's a very confusing kind of entry point. You buy your ticket here, and then you go downstairs. So here's the revised entry, and the idea is that this becomes one, kind of an extension of the street. None of the kind of museumness of ticket buying and such happens to you go downstairs. And this is a kind of, the, the bridge really frames now an entry into the courtyard. Um, we reconfigure how um, ADA access works to get up into that upper level. And it becomes really an extension of the city. Now we're looking down into the courtyard, which is the museum entry. This is the Maryland curve um, that Isasaki was so captivated by in his time in Los Angeles in the 80s, um, which now is reconfigured. The bookstore is now down. Um, the cafe is upstairs. The, most of the bookstore is downstairs. We in, encapsulate the, the, the Maryland curve into a, a kind of um, patio looking over the courtyard and, and transform the stairs. Once you're in that space, um, before, it was always confusing. You entered the museum navigating through people eating, eating food under canopies. And so now, this is really kind of, an, again, extension of the street. It feels much more like a, a civic courtyard um, as an entry point and prelude to the museum. Museum entry was also really confusing um, because you got in and you didn't buy your ticket here. You were, if you missed buying your ticket, you had to go back upstairs. So this is reconfigured as the ticketing space and opened up so that you can really navigate all the different sections of the museum from this one point. And then sort of simple things about reconfiguring um, and gallery entries and such. And then w w during the course of this, um, this is what's before, this is a summary of kind of things we did. We removed um, a, a canopy that Isosaki had added. Then we added the wall and did some surgery on some of these key hinge points in the building. And then eventually, the trustees began to think, well, what would happen if we began to expand the museum? So we started a study looking at adding a second floor on either side on the galleries that kind of um, bookend the museum. And we were inspired by a, a residential building that Isosaki had done around the same time um, that he completed the museum. So this kind of skylight strategy for these second floor galleries harkens back to that, but had a lot of kind of interesting efficiencies in the way that it could bring light into the space and work within this kind of historic formal language while also bringing kind of a new figure to the, to the MOCA campus. So a new director was just named to the museum, so we're gonna, we'll see what happens to this project. But what we found quite interesting is that by kind of densifying the building mass on either end, the courtyard became almost more defined and kind of a more essential space along Grand Avenue. Um, the Museum of Contemporary Art that, that Clay mentioned is a building that we finished in 2017, and we were, it, we were commissioned originally to do a master plan, and then um, uh, we completed a phase one. And so this is another building, um, kind of postmodern building. This is Joseph Paul Kleihus from, it was finished in the mid-90s. And it's a building like, I mean, most museums in Chicago, the legacy of museums in the park are, are strong, but while despite the fact that the MCA does sit in a park, it also feels very disconnected. It sits up on this podium, this overly steep stair, and it feels just like a very monumental building that isn't connected to the city. And um, this is the um, lake side of the building, which is again quite confusing with circulation. Um, it navigates a parking garage underneath. And so these are the, this is the original Kleihus drawings, and this was about the same time he was doing um, like the Hamburger Bahnhof in Berlin. So this metaphor of the station, the railway station, the idea of the museum as a place of passage and transformation was important. The, the idea for him is you'd come up these stairs into the museum, back down and out into the landscape and eventually to the lake. But for various reasons, um, that whole kind of flow never happened. And another kind of key part of the evolution of the building was that it was um, value engineered at a kind of key point in the project. So this grid structure, which was originally 
a 13-foot module was shrunk down to 11 feet. And it sort of really became, made the building um, quite a brutal, it's a concrete building. And it was, it's always feels a little bit too small. So the mission, Madeleine Grinstein is the director, and her mission for us was really to deepen the connections of the museum to the city, and, and both at a master planning scale and um, at the building scale. So just conceptually, how do we strengthen perhaps those initial conceptual conceits of, of Klaihus? And then also at the scale of the block, how do we, through access, transparency, programming, make that threshold between the city and the, and the museum and the city much more fluid? And then equally inside the building, there's a lot of sort of asymmetrical circulation in the, in the building, resulting in, in, in a lot of dead ends. So part of the master plan was to think about that flow. So these before and after model diagrams capture, this is the ground floor, which is a place we did a lot of work, but this dead ending was really brutal. So you came into the theater, but you had to go back out and then up to get upstairs. So the resulting um, plan of the ground floor is that we've opened up this whole space and added a new stair up to a space, a new space called the Commons. So what ends up happening in the end of our project is that we've created, carved out 17,000 square feet of public kind of free space that includes the restaurant and the Commons and classrooms um, all along the kind of north and east edge um, of the building. So this is a before on the ground, on the main museum level with one point of circulation and we propose to add a second stair so that to kind of fulfill the symmetry of the building and create a much more fluid and kind of urban um, situation inside. Equally in section, this is the existing museum before we began to work with a lot of sort of almost overly scaled large volumes of the atrium. And we've um, started this, the phase one project introduced this floor. So we brought a new classroom in. You sort of slipped it in within the structural bay um, of Klaihus and then phases future phases will add this floor as well as a new gallery. So now we have a much more varied um, entry sequence from more intimate space to that ground four-story atrium. Around the biennial, the first biennial in 2015, we had the chance to do a kind of intervention to begin to approximate what our new floor would look like. So this was a project that was examining all the sort of slippages in the Klaihus grid, but was fantastic because it was really like a one-to-one -one mock up and the museum um, loved this space. We had a lot of parties here and I highly recommend um, for, the, for the university to try this whenever you're doing a building or renovation. Let the architects do a mock up um, and have some fun. But um, this stayed up for a year until we, we started demolition. So it was, it was really exciting um, to understand the scale of our future project through that kind of work. So this is before and then this is after and the way that um, we were to create that continuous space. So just a few images of the project. This was also um, a collaboration with the um, London, originally um, he, lives, I th he lives I think now in, in not Tasmania, but this is the work with Chris Ophelia, London, originally London based. So Chris um, worked with us on developing the color palette for the furniture. And the idea is that the minute you enter the museum, you're, you're not confronted with tickets and, and, and bookstores and shopping, but you have just a quiet place to sit down. So that extension and connection to the city was through programs and furnishings like this. Um, there's a really special chef that was you know, deeply invested in the arts community in Chicago, um, Jason Hamill, who we also collaborated with with Chris. And so we created a new restaurant. Um, and private dining room and all the kind of wall drawings and glass etchings are the work of Chris. Uh, so the idea of this space was to really think about it as a kind of urban street. So it's the entry to the theater, the cafe and the restaurant and this vault form um, harkens a little bit to the top floor galleries which are also vaulted but it also reflects the kind of crypt-like quality that you would see in sort of a, a European church or something. The idea that this is not a museum space, but it's something kind of deep in the ground. Um, but both through the artificial lighting and the addition of this new stair, which brings in, finally brings light into the museum, it actually feels quite animated and, and really does feel connected to the outside. This stair is, is very much um, an homage to Klaihus in its form. It, it also serves as a kind of skylight and a kind of acoustical baff, baffle. This, this curved wall is all treated acoustically. So we can have a theater event, a lecture on the museum and an event in the common space and all of those things can happen simultaneously. And then the commons is a new space that used to be the cafe and it is a space where long-term artist interventions happen. This is the work of Pedro Niwana. So working on the ceiling as a space of intervention allows for different kinds of artist projects to happen here um, and public programs without transforming the artist project. 
We also worked at the master plan scale, sort of looking at how to make those connections at the, at the street more um, intimate. So we, we're looking at ways to kind of rescale the, the street um, and the stair and bring art out into the street on the, on the back side of the building, on the east side as well, sort of simplifying that kind of east and west flow in and out of the building and trying to kind of fulfill that um, legacy of museums in the park. And Madeline's dream is to go from this kind of view to this, where she's removed the tennis courts and the baseball fields, and this becomes a really public, open public park. And then the last project I wanted to share is the Manil Drawing Institute, which um, I mentioned will open on November 3rd. So everyone's welcome um, to join us in the opening festivities. Um, we began this project in 2012, and you know, for us, I think this is one of the most important buildings of, of Renzo's career, and so it was really a privilege to think about this building um, over the past seven years and kind of understand it in the history of the Manila campus and what it, how it could inspire our work for the Drawing Institute. Um, the campus, when uh, David Chipperfield did the master plan, this was the existing condition for many years after the finishing of the Twombly Pavilion, which is right here and this is the Manil collection. This large apartment complex was, was there, the Manils bought it, they own 30 acres, so you're seeing, um, they don't own all, everything that's in this slide, but 38, most of it. And this apartment building was a big source of revenue for many years for the, for the foundation. And for us, the, the campus is really kind of one of the kind of consummate um, art experiences maybe anywhere in the world. And, Rainer Banham talked about this space as a neighborhood of neighborhood for art. So that what was so powerful is the way that the Manila Collection Building sits as the kind of mothership, and these pavilions sit in the landscape. They're of course very important to the art experience, and the way that um, what defines this ex the Manila experience is largely through the way natural light works in these spaces, largely top lit galleries. But equally important is the open space, the way that art um, kind of fills those spaces and kind of defines, gives, brings another scale to these large lawns and greens. The bungalows that are, some of, many of which were moved, but largely are um, the, the same um, historic buildings that were there in the neighborhood that have been unified by a coat of gray paint and then programmed both with for Manila offices and also neighbors can rent them out for residential use or, or commercial use. And you know, I think the trees for us were equally important, the scale of the trees, the way that light works in these great oak trees that have been cultivated for many years was, was really part of the kind of ecology of the site. And the Drawing Institute is about 35,000 square feet, so probably by Austin standards, that's a kind of mid-sized house. Um, so it was somehow, um, somehow between the scale of a museum and a residential building. And this is the Johnson House that the Manils commissioned as one of the first buildings um, from the 50s that they built in Houston. And so uh, that building was very important to Renzo. Renzo's building, the Manil collection was finished in 1987 and the house was finished in the 50s. So when Renzo began working with Dominique, because John had already died, like the house was already a really important touchstone for Renzo. This is the courtyard of the Manil house um, and the dark floors of the Manil kind of concrete, um, black concrete tile. And then this is the Manil collection. So this tropical garden was something that they brought from their time in Caracas that made its way into the Manil collection. So this was the master plan be before Chipperfield began his work. Um, and then this was the kind of final plan. Um, and what the Drawing Institute sits here, which is about the geographic center of the campus. This is south and north. And the idea is that there'll be a large, eventually there'll be a large sort of mixed use development along Richmond Avenue, and then perhaps a couple of additional single artist pavilions. We also did the energy house, which is here. So we defined a kind of new green, a new scale of open space on the campus in the relations between the Drawing Institute and the energy house. Conceptually, this was an early collage that we made that was, um, this is a building for drawings, which have very different environmental requirements. So thinking about the roof as a kind of thin sheet of paper, it's, it's fabricated eventually out of plate steel, but the idea that the building is quite small, but the roof extends largely past the building and nests in the trees. So the kind of notion of it as a kind of shelter that embraces the landscape was part of the original conceptual diagram. And there were a number of existing trees from the apartment building that we were able to preserve and create outdoor rooms around, which is the kind of beginning um, planning of the building. And then the interior program sort of fills in the space around those trees. Inside the building, um, the galleries, there's, um, so there's exhibition gallery, conservation lab, 
drawing study center and offices, all relatively small scale rooms. And so the idea that it's almost like capturing, harnessing these residential buildings um, that surround the building and um, nesting within the, the new, the kind of large cantilevered roof. I think building on the, the kind of legacy of kind of generosity of kind of cultural um, programming, um, the idea for the courtyards um, that, that are the entries to the building are such that they kind of are very generous spaces that can host all different kinds of activities that um, bring, bring artists from around the world um, to Houston. And as well, um, on the interior of the building, we created what we call a living room, which is the entry to the building, but it's also another sort of multifunctional space that is kind of intimate yet generous and has the technology embedded into it to allow for exhibitions and presentations to happen. So here's um, a model that gives you a sense of the sort of low-lying roof of the kind of art and, and administration spaces. And then this back building, which is the conservation lab and the study room, is almost like a more generic sort of um, uh, storage box that sits um, up against the residential bungalows to the north. So this is um, before we started. And then this is the view. This is pretty much the view you would see today. Um, and I think what was also different about the Drawing Institute relative to Renzo's building and Francois de Menil's Byzantine Chapel or even the Rothko Chapel was that the Drawing Institute nests right up against some of the, uh, many of these historic bungalows to the north. So that scale was quite important. And you can see how the courtyards work kind of nesting in the building and, and kind of extend that front, front yard kind of typology of space along this street that was existing but we extended in front of the Drawing Institute. So from the south, the building feels quite um, really opaque, almost like a kind of porch that is bigger than a house, but somehow kind of of an indeterminate scale. And then as you move closer to the building, you begin to discover um, the courtyards. This is that new green space that we'll have. Um, we've treated the energy house, which is on the left side of the slide, such that it's a place for projecting movies. They may be some arts in this, in this garden. And then there's a low patio. Um, I wanted to also mention that we're work, we worked with Michael Van Valkenburg's team. I know he's doing some special projects here in Houston. And that was you know, really, along with Michael and his team um, in the landscape, we work with Guy Nortonson as our structural engineer. And a team called um, out of DC, George Sexton was our lighting designer. So all of the way that structure, the, the structure of the canopies of the courtyards, the trees, um, and the way that daylighting was calibrated through these outdoor spaces was essential to the way the building functions on the inside. So you always enter through a garden. This is the west courtyard. You have a diagonal view into the entry um, to the building. And then the opposite on the east side is the east courtyard, a more kind of residential almost feeling planting. And this also gives you a diagonal view into the third courtyard, which is the scholar courtyard. Inside the building is what we call the living room, that space I mentioned, which is this one space in the building where all three of those courtyards are visible. I think it gives you a sense of how light works in the building. And typically what you see in museum buildings is daylit, top toplit galleries. And for us, we couldn't do that because of the demands for um, drawing conservation. Um, but we, the, I think the, the way in which this really harkens back to residential architecture is the idea of, of the side-lit gallery. So light is coming in from the side. It's much more, in a way, dynamic. But through the folds of the roof and the placement of those windows, you're never overexposed to light. So it really does have a residential feeling um, about it, both in the way light works, the scale and form of the architecture. So the gallery is to the south of that living room space. It's, calibrated exactly for drawings. It's a 12 foot six ceiling. And at a certain moment, late, kind of late in the design process, we, we, we worked with, we, we recommended to the director that we actually add windows into that gallery. We knew they wouldn't always be visible, but somehow that connection back out to the, to the landscape seemed important to us to be able to have in certain cases where sculpture or other works were there that would allow us to bring daylight into that gallery. The third courtyard is the scholar courtyard, a very different, um, this is a magnolia tree. It's a smaller scale. And so we're working with these um, plantings. We're able to avoid having um, shading devices. So it really has a very kind of elemental way that you feel connected to the outside here. 
The heart of the building is really the drawing room. It's the one place where drawings can come into immediate contact with daylight. So this is a kind of central, almost axial space. You're looking back out to the scholar courtyard. It's surrounded by salons, which are places where artists, curators, collectors can come and work on shows. Um, so it has a very kind of intimate feeling to it. Immediately adjacent to that is the conservation library. It's, a, it's to the right of this image is the conservation laboratory, which is filled with north light. So this is a kind of works in concert with the drawing room as a research space. And then as you, coming back out, I think the building may perhaps from that south view feels quite um, kind of opaque and, and sort of um, uh, non-revealing of its, of its transparency and its scale. From the west, uh, when you're looking through the living room, it almost feels like a agglomeration of small pavilions. So it's, it's, as you move around it, it feels quite, quite dynamic in a way. And so this view, um, I think, captures for us qualities of the building that we strove for, and I think somehow are embodied in a lot of our work, this sort of quality of being suspended between building and landscape, or inside and outside, and the way that architecture and light come together are um, things of real interest for us. The building um, was built over about three years, and a lot of it was prefabricated. These were these pretty fantastic um, steel panels. We, Guy Nortonson was our structural engineer, and these are half-inch plate steel panels that are stiffened with vertical ribs, you can see, um, you can see here. Um, and then uh, has a kind of light, thin aluminum roof panel over that. So they were built in a factory nearby and then just trucked to the site. This is also plate steel. And then the, ins the cladding of the building is um, a kind of engineered cedar, cedar boards that are bead blasted and naturally oiled. So that's what you're seeing on the inside of the courtyards here. These were from about four or five months ago, so the landscape had just been placed. The living room under construction gives you a sense of how light really functions in that space. And just the last image I want to show you is a little movie. Here's my... Oh, tap it again. Okay, thank you, Eric. So this is the view of the Drawing Institute from the porch of the Manila Collection. Twombly is on the right. The west elevation of the Drawing Institute. This is the west courtyard sort of moving diagonally across towards the entry. The baby's crawling across the living room floor. <laughs> some, for some reason, this was a good idea when we were doing this video. I can't tell you why we did that now. But now looking into the gallery. Now you're in the scholar courtyard. And the split screen with the gallery on, this, on the right side. This is the drawing room on the left. That's a view into the salon, which is one of those flanking spaces around the drawing room. Conservation laboratory. The skylights in this and the drawing room can just with a few different shading devices can go from fully blacked out. So it's a very low tech, but it gives them the, the scholars a lot of range in terms of lighting conditions in that room. So this is the west, uh, sorry, the east courtyard, the view into the scholar courtyard, the south porch. Thank you so much. Should we? <laughs> uh, maybe we can take one or two quick questions, if there are any.
Sharon, uh, thank you so much for coming today. It was a beautiful lecture and beautiful work. Um, so earlier, Clay mentioned that you spent time in Switzerland, mm -hmm. um, and also that your practice is obviously based in LA, those being two extremely disparate architectural right. cultures, one being quite stern and serious, um, not in a negative fashion, mm -hmm. and one being whimsical and playful. Could you maybe speak on your takeaways from these cultures and how maybe they've affected your practice or played into how you've evolved as an architect? Yeah, I think, thanks for the question. Um, I, I think we, we love Switzerland, um, you know, with a lot of admiration for a lot of the work. I think it's, you know, given also our interest in art, I think it's, as a building culture, it's, um, you know, at least the work that we were exposed to, um, you know, there's a lot of kind of reciprocity between contemporary art and art historically um, and, and the building practice. I think coming back to Los Angeles, um, we were very clear that we were, we were not going to be part of a culture that respected the kind of craft of building in the same way, and that we felt it would be an uphill battle to expect that. And so I think there was a, you know, we hadn't started our practice yet, but there was a, we, we, we see ourselves as sort of realists. You know, we, we, we have had the chance now to work in a lot of different kinds of building cultures. And I think we, you know, one of the things that we focused on quite a lot in our early practice um, in our residential buildings was, was the way, you know, apertures work, the way, a focus on structure and the way in which apertures work. And, you know, we, we, we came home from Switzerland, we were looking at A plus U and looking at publications and you could immediately tell where was a European building and where was an American building. And largely through the windows, through the way that the, the kind of engineering of the window itself and the way that it, it, it engaged um, the structure of the building. And so we, we sort of took that. I mean, you know, Frank Gehry, especially his early career, was really important to us in the way that he sort of embraced the vernacular, the sort of sloppy vernacular of building in Los Angeles and turned it into something that, you know, was defining for his career. And I, for us, that was, you know, that was really. Um, informative and so we you know I think we have tried to um, aspire to quality um, but we also you know accept the kind of messiness sometimes of, of how we need to build like the vault house for example whenever we have shared that project with European colleagues they always kind of immediately assume it's a casting case concrete building really heavy um, and you know, there was no way we could do that both for budget and for the con conditions of building on the beach, which required us to have breakaway walls and, and make a very different kind of stick frame construction. So I think you know, we, we still have a lot of um, exchange with our European colleagues, but we also, um, you know, we, we're, we're based here and we, we really try to embrace, um, we try to elevate, but embrace um, the building culture that we work in. And we, we do invest a lot of energy in the construction phase of our projects because we, you know, we realize that's where it's gonna happen or not. It doesn't matter how good your documents are. If you're not there on site working with, working with builders, it's just, it's not gonna happen. Yeah. Okay, thanks. <laughs>